It's a pleasure to be here, uh, just in time for Doug's arrival. And uh, uh, some of you are, are probably a turn of insight, and uh, this talk is similar, which is about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, but, uh, but different. So I've made some changes, just for those of you who may have seen questions before, just so you're surprised. And this is not part of my slide. <laughs> But uh, hopefully it'll uh, switch back. Welcome everybody from TV Land, as we used to say. Uh, we're recording things, and here we go. Uh, I get the whole screen? <laughs> or, there we go. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about a uh, concept which I've been throwing around uh, for a little while called Big Machine. And, uh, and I'm going to try to uh, communicate the kind of the state we're in. Uh, in terms of what I think we're building in terms of the big machine. I'm going to set a bit of a context, and I'm going to try to you know, motivate some of the activities. Uh, many people have contributed to this, and I, I can't even go to the list, because a lot of this isn't my work. Many of it is perspectives built from others' work, but also uh, the work of many individuals here who are working on different parts of this big machine, and how it's starting to come together. So I, I can't list everybody, and I apologize in advance if I, if I can miss someone or I fail to acknowledge someone's input in terms of the thinking around this. So uh, my apologies because there's a big machine, uh, and this is not part of my talk either. <laughs> so, sneaking out. Just a, a momentarily <laughs> note. <laughs> parts of the document like this, they're not parts of my talk. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, this actually has been a, a collaboration of funding from a variety of sources. Uh, <laughs> 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 Hey, on OTN, can you guys stop sending your presentation? Because you keep uh, interrupting the talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's like a photo bomb. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you talk about? Okay, so let's get going. I'm going to run out of time. Wow, this is a big machine. not working very well. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, okay, um, and individuals uh, such as Hugo Ertz and Andre Dexter. <laughs> so, so, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe to you, and I'll go a little quickly through it because I run out of time, some of the little machines we've been building over the years. And I'm going to talk about how we've learned about the importance of those little machines. This is a picture I like to say is Rock Mackey making his first tonal therapy machine. You can see him welding the. This is uh, getting a little irritating. You can see him welding the ring. And my point here is that physicists and clinicians in radiation oncology have actually done a lot to make machinery as part of how we treat radiotherapy clinicians. And in fact, there's clinicians and physicists that are active in building new systems uh, uh, and have a long history in this activity. So I'm going to you quickly. This is not slowing down. In fact, we've seen more types of machines on the planet in terms of proton machines, for example, or MR guidance machines. A lot of technology that's coming to modify how we apply therapeutics uh, in cancer care. And these systems are integrating imaging data and therapeutics. Our platform that we're building in terms of MR guided radiation therapy here at Princess Margaret, as well as others at the group in Utrecht, these, these machines are going to change the way we apply therapeutics. And we'll continue to do it. And we're going to continue to do it not only at this scale, we're going to do it at other scales. And these devices will continue to be built. And there's no question about that. We'll have other types of machinery, like the adaptive machinery. It allows us to really think about moving data sets through and tuning the intervention to the patient. And we, as interventionalists, we often focus on these parts of the system. Whether it's that device that lets us play displace dose more accurately, more precisely, or a system that lets us measure and respond and adapt to an interventional model in the context of radiotherapy. And more pieces are needed to even test the hypotheses you imagine around these things, around adapting care and uh, modifying treatments such as auto segmentation tools, deformation registration, dose tracking and refining. And we've been using the computer as part of the machinery for many years. This is a great picture of uh, Jack Cunningham, who will be here in Toronto for the World Congress next month. And you can see Jack's tools, his machinery that he used to you know, change the way we treat patients by more accurately uh, predicting the dose associated with the application of our beans. Classic. Uh, picture of Jack. That's what Trevor there, all these cheap bikes, you know, these tapes, those of you who know those are tapes for young people in the audience. <laughs> and then we have other great uh, IT innovators and technology innovators, such as uh, the work that was uh, put forward by Tom and Mike, with many people contributing, the idea of you know, automating, using computers to allow us to 
change our process. And these are all really important parts in, in, in this machinery. And I'm sure many of you have seen this video of, of the auto planning activity. It allows us now to not only, you know, you know, shorten the time interval for treatment planning in terms of breast context, but also to try to regularize the way we practice in terms of how we name structures. And this is a synergistic element. It's not just about one piece of machinery that says automate and save time. That investment in that piece of machinery resonates across the board because, as Thomas pointed out, and Mike has pointed out, others have pointed out, that the naming of all the structures in this plan becomes very consistent. So that structured thinking, that automation, starts to actually connect across. And this is where the kind of the big machine thinking kind of gets, gets off the ground. I'm not going to go through this. And this is not just in radiotherapy. This is happening across the board, whether it's you know, checklists and surgery or image-guided surgery or measuring what kind of drug delivery we have in the context of medical oncology. All these innovations are happening at different points in time. And as we progress, there'll be more of them. You know, we're pretty proud of the machines we make. That's all, you know, fine. But I would suggest that in general, we're generally unsatisfied with the broader impact of these innovations. I think within oncology, there's an, we can see ourselves working away at different points, but are we really moving the field forward? I mean, I think there's a general angst that we should think about addressing and how could we address it. And as Aristotle says, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And I think we're ready to think about a different approach that takes the compelling part of building machines, which I find very attractive, maybe the physicists find it attractive, and the engineers, maybe the rat who really want to be engineers, but thought they should go into medicine. <laughs> uh, might find compelling. Is this thinking around the big machine? Now, the big machine thinking is seeing those small pieces work together to you know, go to the next level in terms of how we advance cancer care. And I, and I call it the big machine because it really is stepping back. And why do we need to step back? Why is it time, or what are the indicators that suggest we should step back and think about a big machine instead of these small pieces? The small pieces are very important. Don't get me wrong. They're critical. We don't know how critical they are, in fact. But understanding how critical they are actually requires us to get this bigger picture. So personalized cancer medicine is a perfect context for us to start to think about this because we're realizing that, in fact, there's variations in the population, and responding to those variations is quite key, or understanding the reason for those variations is quite key to understand why our change in practice is or is not improving care. Try this morning. So this is a great quote by uh, William Oster. William lived in Weston, Ontario, just about a mile and a half north of my house, he went to McGill. Then he went up to Hopkins and started a pretty good medical school that's been pretty successful. And he has this great quote, if it was not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science and not an art. And I think medicine would be much more of a science. Those of you who think that art's important, that's okay too. But I think it'd be much more of a science. And the reason I think that we can think about this uh, as, a, as much more of a science is that, what does he mean by variability? Variability because it didn't turn out the way he thought the intervention should turn out? Variability because, you know, humans are all different? Why, why is it an art and not a science? And you could ask questions around individuals. Is he referring to the patients are variable or the practitioners are variable? So there's two things. We need to understand the patient very well. We also need to understand exactly what we did. And so those two pieces are quite key to, you know, advancing the personalized cancer medicine paradigm. So what does the paradigm promise? It promises improvements in the therapy of ratio by treating the right patient for the right therapy, more accurate prediction of outcome and toxicity, maybe even optimized use of healthcare resources. If it's not going to be useful for a patient, we don't treat them. Personalized medicine requires those some really important things, robust quantitative measurements to stratify response on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. That's not started at the beginning of therapy, but also over the course of therapy. And these are tissue and serum-derived markers and medical imaging-derived markers, measurements that characterize the genotype, the phenotype, the time-dependent phenotype, the immunotype, all these different things that are temporally dynamic, which we now understand. We need to understand how we put a robust, well-characterized intervention against a well-characterized normal and disease state. That's a really interesting big machine problem. And personalized medicine requires precision in treatment because we're not precise in what we do. We can't even pull apart the cohorts because we're not applying the therapeutic consistently. So we have to think about the sort of measurement 
and monitoring at a much higher scale. The pieces inside there are just as important, but we have to have the big machine working as well. And so I, I tried to capture this a little bit in this article back in, in 2012, seems <laughs> long ago now, where in fact, we're now starting to do this. We're imaging and we're using tissue to characterize the patient and the disease process. We then go into intervention cycle and we start a treatment, we image, and we guide. And this guide could just be shifting, which we do now, a paradigm where we're injecting a lot of information into the process, but it could be much more. It could be a measure of hypoxia. It could be a measure of metabolic activity. But the key thing in all this stuff is that we have to track it. This is a giant informatics and information collection process. If we don't get the outcomes, we'll never really understand all the modifications we're making here. And as we do this, we, we need to characterize for each individual patient, not necessarily just the cohorts, each individual patient, their characteristics and the response to our modification. So this is our biggest machine yet. This machine isn't just about radiotherapy, it's about all cancer care. Because radiotherapy is not applied in isolation, as we know. In fact, I would argue that personalizing cancer medicine will be advanced in institutions that can integrate multiple biomarkers, accurate records of high quality treatments, and robust outcome records. If you don't put these together, you're not going to compete. And this is, I think, a really important picture that we have to not stop thinking about, hey, I got some tissue and I've seen something in the clinic, I'm going to pull in someone to do some bioinformatics work, and we're going to work over here and conclude something. <coughs> that approach, that cottage-based approach, I don't think is the future. Not for the competitive ecosystem. I think what we need to do is institutionalize that, and that's the big machine. We have to be careful not to take out the individual drive, that's really risky. But we need to get our operational level up to the point you now can work with this big machine to answer tough questions because that's where I think the real impact will be. I mean, in terms of you know cancer interventions, extremely complex time dependent process. The measures, the interventions, the outcomes. We really need to think about how we can build this into a platform of continuous learning. And I'll try to convince you why this is important. I mean, from some data. And many of you have seen some of these slides before, but. I think it's uh, helpful to try to make the case. This is a single institution observation from MD Anderson during technological transitions from basic uh, CRT and conventional CT to 40 CT and IRT. This is just a time period before 2004 and after 2004. And they show substantial differences in overall survival and freedom from grade three or higher radiation pneumonitis in their own practice. So this is, you know, temporal, not randomized single institution. But the magnitude of technological change impact on outcomes is substantial, and it's constantly changing. We're not fixed. We're in a constant dynamic state, and this data is constantly shifting. So, you know, these are big differentials. There are other things going on, we understand that, but there are big differentials. Similarly to prostate cancer, this paper which I talked about many too, many, too many times, you know, a classic example in the context of prostate cancer, where a fellow, or no, the Gravassier visited there, and he was looking at differentials in biochemical outcome for prostate cancer, and then retrospectively, he looked at the CT scans that were used for finding those patients. And he noticed that the rectum was full on some patients, and the rectum was empty on other patients. And he started to notice, by human observation, that the difference in biochemical control rates seemed to correlate with whether or not the rectum was full or empty. So he formulated a hypothesis, this is retrospective as well, of course, and he said, well, if the prostate's full, maybe during planning, maybe the prostate's displaced, the rectum's full, maybe the prostate's displaced. And if it was empty, this introduces a systematic error in the placement of the radiation beams. And so this is simply the concept. This is the plan. The rectum is full. I put the beams on there. During the course of treatment, on average, the prostate shifts back and there's a, a systematic miss. This is the hypothesis. And so we just simply sorted the observation though on this uh, retrospective analysis according to cross-sectional area of the, of the rectum. A huge differential in biochemical control. So, let's say you were doing a study with some other modification therapy and MD Anderson, while this was your practice, you've got a huge variability going on against your uh, other you know, comparison in terms of outcome. And of course, now this is now resolved. People use image guidance, and this has been repeated in other institutions to demonstrate, and in fact, it's important to hit the target. And so quality is really important in terms of pulling these differences apart. And I won't talk to this very much because Brian uh, is here. This is, in fact, a prospective analysis of quality. Brian clarified that in the past when I presented on this and demonstrating that quality is really important 
in terms of identifying whether or not a modification to therapy, a proposed modification of context for randomization, can be detected. And this is highlighted in this comment. And that uh, in the context of head and neck cancer treatment in the community, the results strongly reinforce the importance of doing well, we already know. And he goes on to say, it's sobering to note that the value of good rate of therapy is substantially greater than the incremental gains that have been achieved with new drugs and biologists. I don't know if this comment uh, was so critical to uh, be made, but I think the real important thing is if we don't know what we apply, it's really hard to learn more in terms of exploring other modifications to therapy. The other really interesting example from a tissue perspective is the HPV story in head and neck cancer where an underlying biological process actually defined two different phenotypes of disease present in this population, which we used to treat as one. But now a measurement allowed us to identify that these are, in fact, two different populations. So in, in this context, it's an extremely measurement-hungry process that's going on. This process becomes very measurement-oriented. We need to start to characterize the state of the patient and the disease. And it's not just in the context of radiotherapy, but surgery, chemotherapy, and other contexts. And I think imaging is a really important part of this. As we think about a machinery that we bring up to start to characterize this, we need to really think about imaging as an important part. And I'm not going to dwell too much time on this, but I'll give you some feeling that these kinds of phenotypic characterizations can be appropriate with measurement uh, using imaging methods. And there's a nice uh, Fidani paper from 2010 that kind of highlights the different probes that could be used to characterize this. And I think if we think about a process where we want to have characterization of disease, we need to have some way we can make repeat measurements. And I think this is one element which we're investing in, but I won't go on too much. So is there any evidence? It'd be very nice to measure some things, for example, hypoxia in the context of uh, patient characterization in terms of predicting response. We have nice point-based measurements from our own organization that highlights the value of these kinds of measurements. And this has actually driven us to start to bring a signal online that allows us to characterize the degree of hypoxia in patients. And I think we'll see as we move forward that there are other signals that are really important to bring online. This is a publication from Hugo Erickson, I'll talk about it a bit later, that there are other signals in these imaging measurements that we can use to guide and characterize the state of the patient. We can even go further. This is not just radiotherapy. It's a really nice example where Differential in the quality of drug delivery in the context of gemcitabine is argued to be an important factor in predicting outcomes. Just illustrating using BCECT techniques, the differential uh, in outcome between low area of the curve uptake or, or high area of the curve uptake highlights a, a differential in response to the patients. So it's not just a quality of radiotherapy therapy question. There's another part of the machine, which is the quality of drug delivery. And these are relatively uncharacterized and an open territory, but we need to think about those because we're being combined therapeutics as, uh, as is obvious. So how, how can we pull together this sort of multimodal perspective? And I did this for three different examples, and this was part of a grant that we wrote a couple of years ago that I'll talk about more in a second, but it really became clear to me that we need to sort of think about a much more integrated view. So let's just take three examples. Head and neck cancer. Overall survival, the importance of uh, HPV characterized by P16, around a 20% effect. This was published in 2009. Disease-free survival, these are, we're mixing these a little bit. Disease-free survival, as of text from the Mortensen study from 2012, is about a 33% effect. And local regional control in terms of RC compliance, about a 20% effect. The magnitude of these variations are of the same scale. So you know, we if we know that there's you know, unknown unknowns behind the scene at this scale, how can we pull this apart? What numbers do we need to actually achieve that? The scale of this and the consistency of practice that's required. In the context of prostate cancer, if we don't know the quality with which we're applying radiotherapy, that's a 25% effect. Presence of oxygenation might stay at a 25% effect. Or you know, something that was completely over a left field, application of metformin in this context, a 10% effect. That's a part of the machine that's way over for me. How do we pull that part of the information in to try to dissect these effects? Or non-small cell lung cancer, local control response, FDG PET response signal, 40%. This is from the Maastricht group. CT feature, Hugo Eric's data, around a 10% effect. Radiotherapy technique, 
you apply 40 and IMRT versus non, so it's be pre 40. MD Anderson single institution study, 25% effect. Or here's one that's quite a ways over cardiac function and radiation pneumonitis. I mean, here it's, it's toxicity and here it's control. But the point is, without drawing these elements together, it's very hard to isolate this out. So the big machine is really about drawing these pieces together so that we can integrate this multimodal perspective. So it's a bit of a paradox. To get personal requires us to get industrial. How do we draw these pieces together? And I think understanding cancer and developing personalized cancer medicine strategies and delivering high-performance cancer therapy are all part of the same challenge. It's really about building a system that allows us to learn what we're doing. I think getting industrial actually has a huge collaborative opportunity. There's standards and nomenclature, this is engineers like that, precision and accuracy in our measurements and our treatment delivery. This is an alignment between image guidance and allowing us to identify a cohort for you know, a differential outcome or, or allowing us to detect the value of a hypoxia fighting therapeutic. That's a really interesting alignment. The collaboration then in terms of statistical strength and multi-institutional studies so we can connect <coughs> these pieces and then the informatics component. I think the alignments are really interesting. So safety and quality is a priority, so very striking, consistency in application of therapeutic, advancing the nomenclature so that we can share the information, having a common uh, uh, language, standardization and treatment methods in terms of delineation standards. This is as important to personalized cancer medicine, possibly as the next you know, new target in terms of targeted therapeutics. Of course, key is measuring outcomes, whether it's paper performance kind of a US model or expertise group, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And the engineering principles that maybe Steve talked about last week, which I wish, wish I could have heard that, they underpin a lot of these concepts of measurement, response, and directed change. And this is a really great way to think about what we've been doing. We've been building these machines in isolation. But what's the big machine look like? How do, we, how do we reposition ourselves, and how does it let us think about our engagement? I mean, one perfect example, as you discussed in this room, is the physics versus biology pendulum. So you've all seen this slide, maybe sociologists are here, the psychologists say sociology is just applied psychology, the biologists say psychology is just applied biology, the chemists say biology is just applied chemistry, and of course you have physicists, which is just applied physics. <laughs> and the mathematicians are over here, oh hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. <laughs> we'll need the mathematicians too, actually. So it's a really interesting blue ocean approach. I mean, if we're all going to sit there, I mean, there's no single element, it's not the tissue, it's not the imaging. It's not the outcome, it's not the quality of the intervention in isolation. If you ever played this game, it's quite fun. Four people on a two, you fall over if you don't work together. And in the context of radiotherapy, there's been ongoing dialogue by these two uh, uh, provost physicists talking about, are we technicians, are we clinician scientists? This actually resolved the issue. It's really amazing opportunity for us to think about a machinery that lets us learn by our clinical practice and build the components, and every piece is important. It's like we're forced to a convergence. And I think Einstein said this really well. Things should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. The cottage approach of hoping that this observation over here will get me a Nobel Prize, that's very nice. But I think what we really need to do is start to bring things together and realize that it's a complex system. Can we work together to draw the complexities together and address and look at these dependencies? So converting on the promise of personalized cancer really is from delivering state-of-the-art care to driving the next generation of care. Building a machine to allow us to do that. Complexity of data collection, decision-making, delivery. And then simultaneously maximizing intervention performance to test hypotheses. If we clean up our therapeutic instrument, more precise instrument, as clean as possible, that may reveal things. I mean, you could say, prove it to me first, but if you really want to be at the forefront, you push the precision of your instrument first. And this is where we want to be. Building cancer informatics tools is also key, and I'll talk about that right at the end. So I'm going to give you three approaches that suggest that big machine thinking is taking over the world. This is a guy named Jeff Immelt. He'll be in Toronto uh, in the start of June. Mary will be talking to him on the stage, along with Bob Bell. It's not too late to register. But Jeff Immelt is the CEO of GE, and he is an applied mathematician. There you go, Doug. Oh, you like that? That's an applied man. I'm going to be the CEO of GE. <laughs> That's right, Doug. You can. <laughs> this is not America, but it's close. So when you want to answer a really big question, you get a lot of talented people together, you distribute the work, and you build a machine. So what Jeff's been talking about for the past little while is something called the industrial internet. The internet's been really cool for humans to talk to each other. Jeff is saying, that was cool. 
Now we want machines to talk to each other. This is called the industrial internet. Yeah. The first step to taking over. <laughs> Well, this is possible without being perfect. So, so he's, this, is a, this is a slide, but it's really interesting. You can dial this tomorrow in 2020. By 2020, there will be 52 billion connected devices on the planet. There will be seven devices per capita worldwide. Now, what GE is saying, these will all be connected. And they will be learning together and functioning together. There's a great video of a train. All devices through the internet interacting. Oh, Skynet, here we come. <laughs> This is a JAMA article highlighting medical tools and sensors. And by 2020, there will be a, a trillion sensors worldwide collecting information from people <coughs> on what they're doing. Five million individual sequence. If you look at the, the GD's drive on this, it's really interesting. They're basically taking this sort of sub pieces and starting to connect it together. I'm not suggesting we need to make Skynet personalized cancer medicine. Uh, but I think this kind of trend is just clearly moving forward. So you take a physicist approach. And maybe you've seen these slides before. When you want to answer a big question, you get a bunch of people together, you distribute their work, and you build a machine. And this is a classic. You know, you've seen this slide before. I love this slide. I can't resist this slide. And this is uh, at CERN. And uh, my favorite part of this was we actually went down. Mike took this picture. Uh, we went down to the bottom of the CMS that was open. Uh, Google and Aldi had us there for a front uh, carbon conversation. And uh, that's an amazing place. It's now closed. You can't go down there. Uh, they're ramping it up right now. It'll be a couple of years running. But these guys, what they did is they said, we want to answer a really hard problem. What are we going to do? We're going to, you know, smash two things together, high energy. And then we're going to put a detection system around it. And then after we put the detection system around, we're going to connect a whole IT architecture that's going to measure what happens when these interactions happen. And we have hypotheses about what to expect, and we're going to see whether those events happen, and we're going to sort the data according to the expected hypothesis, because there's so much data coming off the stage. So they didn't just build these detectors, huge magnetic fields and detection events, you can see that you can see the human right there at the scale. But they also built the entire data analysis system and learning platform that propagates off of that. It's a lot different than what we do in healthcare. You know, we have a patient show up and we try to deal with it. It's completely different thinking in terms of the framing of the machine. This doesn't just happen there. It's a very huge network, and the data is shared, and there's multiple people. In fact, there's multiple groups competing simultaneously to analyze the detection, and if they both get a result, then the conclusion is robust. That's how the approach works. There's another approach. This is the Institute of Medicine approach. And uh, when you want to answer a very big question, you get lots of talented people together, you distribute their work, and you build a machine. This is a really interesting article, the Institute of Medicine, Best Care at Lower Cost, Path to Continuous Learning Healthcare in America. It's a really interesting article. I suggest that you get a chance to, to read it. It's available deeply on the internet. This is what global experts in healthcare think about healthcare. We have some science. We have poorly managed insights. That science builds crude evidence, highly biased, probably in its propagation. The evidence is poorly used. We then attempt to deliver some care. We don't really know, really know what we delivered, and that's the patient experience. This is the this is what the world says we are doing with healthcare now. <coughs> what they're doing is something they probably stole from Deming, or maybe Steve talked with us last week, I don't know. Is that we need to really think about a continuous process where care advances science, builds evidence, returns to care. And this process is dynamic and it has elements of culture leadership and incentives, and it engages and propagates. And the key thing on this is the zeros and ones. It's kind of a repetitive pattern, but the point is, is that this is enabled substantially by technology and the exchange of information. The philosophy is not. The culture is not. It has to be built. Uh, but the technology is an enabling factor. So they gave us four key characteristics of a learning healthcare system. I'm going to go through them really quickly. Patient-clinician partnership. Engaged, empowered patients, with learning healthcare systems anchored to patient needs and perspectives, and promotes inclusion of patients, families, and caregivers. This, I think, is quite clear, and we've talked about this actually in strategic planning in the past couple of days how important this is in getting outcomes, quality of life, quality of death. That's a really hard outcome to get. I was trying to figure that out. Ouija board, I don't know how that's going to work. But quality of life, quality of death, really important things in the context of cancer. Culture, leadership and still culture of learning. A learning healthcare system is steward by leadership committed to a culture of teamwork, collaboration, and adaptability 
in support of continuous learning as a core aim. So rather than, I mean, one thing to focus on care, that's very important for patient care, but also to focus on making sure we learn as much as possible from that care activity. And this is the kind of thinking and how we invest in that and bring that forward. Incentives is really interesting. Uh, they, they, they talk about incentives, but many of the incentives that they kind of drive towards are kind of paper performance kind of thinking. The idea that, you know, if you have a patient come back from care, this is a, kind of the US model, within a certain time interval, then you don't get paid for that subsequent work. You need to keep them out long enough. And this is kind of an incentive approach in the context of healthcare that's sort of in the, in the uh, paper performance view. But I think there's another approach that I think really resonates with what we like to do here. <coughs> that's the uh, mastery guy. So mastery, as we've learned before, is also a very powerful incentive. So maybe we're not going to have the paper performance approach. We know that, that gets to a certain level. And if you've seen this great talk, which I think I think Mary showed to us in the past on it by Daniel Pink, is that there are factors beyond financial reimbursement that actually drive uh, individual performance and uh, personal satisfaction, either autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And so there's a very interesting opportunity to align a learning healthcare system concept and the importance of incentives with the building of mastery. So if you come to an organization like Princess Margaret, you'd suggest that, wow, all these resources, I can be great, I can learn, I can advance, but then you ask yourself, where's the support to make that happen? What's the machinery to allow me to build my mastery? I think this is a really interesting uh, context to sort of to think about how we adapt the uh, learning health system incentive piece to something where people actually really, really want to join and stay so they can build mastery. And the final piece is science informatics. This is important. No single piece can be missing. Real-time access to knowledge, a learning healthcare system, continuously and reliably captures, curates, and delivers the best available evidence to guide, support, tailor, and improve clinical decision-making, care, safety, and quality. And I would suggest in a research hospital, we have to go even down further. The unknown unknowns have to be allowed to be explored. It's not just about protocolization and following evidence-based care. It's about allowing us to explore, because you don't want a system that locks down to the current standard. You want something that allows variation, because the variation will expose the gradients, and the gradients tell us where to go next. <clears throat> so we kind of compiled this kind of thinking into a project called the Big Machine Proposal. And I worked with Andre Decker extensively, and many others, Brad, and a whole bunch of people, all pictures, Hugo, and Ming, and Tom, and Drew, and Anna, and Igor, and many others who helped. Benjamin Dave Keynes and others, to kind of think about an approach, a big machine approach. What are the key signals? What are the key features? How do we bring those together to visualize, to leverage the human intuition, and to have machines help us learn? And so we, we structured this, this grant, and we submitted, we didn't get funded, but we got great reviews except for one. The one that came in last, unfortunately. And uh, so the data is big here. It's big and hairy. That's not you would color. Okay, big and hairy here. Then we have to think about is it qualified? Do we trust the data? Is the data robust? So we can't just take all that data and throw it We need to then extract features. That feature extraction piece. And once those features are extracted, we could share them. We have these features. You could discover the presence of those features. You could negotiate access. And then you could learn together through a learning platform. So we propose an entire architecture, which I kind of go through. It's pretty cool. We even got a letter from Tim Berners-Lee saying, this is cool. Uh, we didn't get funding despite that. It's unbelievable. Uh, so uh, still cool. it's still pretty cool. We got the letter. I haven't got the letter. And so the question that remains, and we didn't get the funding, but how can we do this? We do this. It's pretty clear to me that if you don't pull the stuff together, uh, we won't compete. Major organizations advancing personalized cancer medicine have to get this right. So can we bring the signals together? Is it crazy? Can we still do this? We don't have a big budget for the big machine, but I would suggest that big machines are made out of small cogs that spin. And remarkably, there's a lot of small cogs spinning. We just have to get them to start to mesh. We're not meshing yet, but I want to try to give you a hint that in fact there's a lot going on. I'm going to go pretty fast. Intervention performance. We're doing this. We want to understand what dose we give to each patient. This is a project in radiation medicine program. This is a project called Ray Station. So a project called Dose Reconstruction and Monitoring. And we decided to bring Raystation as a new planning system in. We wanted to go from current practice, which is 
3D anatomy and dose computation, assumptions regarding the nature of geometric stability, you know, some confirmation of machine performance, image-based evaluation of the geometry, the patient sets up, good. Well, what does that mean in terms of the dose applied? Statistical arguments combined with geometric measurements to evaluate compliance with prescription. We project what's happening to our patient. So we have this idea. Is it technologically capable for us to actually no longer do that? No longer work in this you know, implied state, but actually more explicitly. Can we actually accumulate? <coughs> How would radiotherapy change if we worked in dose space all the time? This is the kind of direct drive radiotherapy. I gave a talk at 8 p.m. and it was in it was at the NASCAR place in, in Indianapolis, and so I had to use this framing. But is there any benefit to implementing an approach that moves the field of radiation oncology from being plan and assumption based to being actual dose based? What are the types of benefits one could expect? And in fact, I argue that there's three benefits. One, the adaptation opportunities. We'll start to see where we're placing the dose. I don't think we fully use the precision and accuracy of our machine because we, we have to make this implicit argument around the geometry. I think I know where things are, so things are good. I think if we actually break that bare, the actual dose applied, we will actually push the technology hard. There's no synchronization there. If we drive that synchronization through dose, we could push harder. Quante, we can measure the dose we deliver to each normal structure. And if we collect it up, wow, the quantic data we could build just as part of our practice. Amazing. And then the quality agenda. No outliers. We track those all the time. So what do we need to do this? We need to be able to calculate the actual dose. We need a time-dependent description of the anatomy and its guidance. We need a method to calculate the dose apply at each point in time, and then we need to have a deformation model. And we should do this, and we should lever automation technology to make it possible. This is something we published back in 2010. Patricia was on this paper back then. And so we purchased the technology in 2012. It was premature, immature, I would say. Uh, we've been wrestling with the company to make this happen. They're very much on board about making this happen. And we're currently in the process of deployment and commissioning activities, and John Pierre has been leading this. A couple people have led, led this activity, and it's been some changes but uh, for various positive reasons. And uh, medical physicists and, and, <laughs> and, and babies, okay. <laughs> to say it. And uh, we're, we're moving forward. So now we're at the point where being, the models are being used. And John Pierre, some of these slides stuff, right? And uh, things are coming. I have a nice report that's running along on our operations side. They have this thing up and running, showing that we can calculate those. And this is beautifully scripted on the back end of this platform. And the ability to now to start look at accumulating dose. We license the Morpheus technology to research so we understand it. Mike Bellick's trying to you know, verify it works in more complex geometries and anatomy. And the ability to actually record the dose at the word three time. So if we have a plan and delivered, what does that delivered dose mean when transported back to the anatomy at the time of planning? And what is the difference? So our hypothesis is we can make this work in this process as part of our care, such that we are scoring the dose delivered to structures through time. This is a hard problem. It's not going to happen everywhere. Image quality is a big factor and so on and so forth. So this is what we're wrestling with. But I mean, we've got an incredibly interesting activity where we're actually taking the operational elements from the point of view of physics and therapy working together to think about how this actually will run. So our latest sort of numbers, and jump here, I don't know if these are the latest, latest, but they're eight and a half minutes for us now. There's quality issues on imaging and so on to turn the crank for a dose accumulation on a patient. So we'll push that hard to automate more. So the patient's treated in 15 minutes, there's an eight and a half minute activity someone has to do to get that dose accumulated. That's getting pretty close. If we can get that down to a few minutes, we can actually start to accumulate dose in every patient and then show that back to the clinical process and then score that. So then we can do outcomes in, in a contact type work which we discussed, Patricia and, and Drew, and on this topic for a while, but we actually build in the machinery to do it on, on course. The most interesting part, I think, about this is actually engage the clinical program. Talked to Alan at length about this. And this uh, whole idea that this paradigm shift is uh, for us to think about how the case expert and the radiation oncology domain, and the role of therapy in tracking and monitoring and activating and looking at triggers that activity in terms of quality and a key input the outcome, which is dose supply. What about uh, that's the intervention uh, performance? That's very nice. We get all this data, but maybe you've heard of some stuff done by this really cool guy named Tom Purdy. I don't know if Tom's in the room. Tom, you in the room? Tom, 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 Tom's in the room. So he has another platform he's been working with a number of individuals, including Mike and others, and 
JIT Gavin. And what they've been doing is they've been working on a system that lets you push the radiotherapy plants and cause structures. And they don't, you know, do the dose calculation. What they do is they say, well, let me pull the features out of this. Because I remember I said, you have lots of data, you have to know it's good, and then you have to feature extract. And so they've been building a pipeline that allows us to do this, not just to visualize data. It's called Evoke. It's funded by a number of sources. The team's been very good at doing that. Where they can look at the data, they can store the data in terms of its elements, and they can automate the analysis, mainly from a QA perspective. It's like an automated version of web publishing, if you could imagine. And you can look at cohorts and subpopulations. And the key thing about this is this platform becomes a really powerful feature extraction. But as we're accumulating this dose, as it's being recorded, we can, and we currently do, ship plans to Tom's system. And he pulls features up, very complex features, adjacency of structures. And he's building a very powerful method for us to extract features. And then he'll be able to expose them. We can then go ask questions about outcomes and start to look back across this platform. So <laughs> visualization, you know, things that allow us to do QA, and then generate specific details for individual patients. I have not what about outcomes measures? Well, we've got a great history in this organization in terms of development of e-cancer care for allowing us the fast sheet for outcomes collection. We've been building a platform uh, which is called Cancer Informatics Platform, which is a tool that we've really been focusing on presenting data in the clinical context so that we can capture outcomes in a consistent fashion across all disease sites. Working with the clinicians to identify the key metrics to be collected and providing it in a, a, a model that allows it to be applied in the clinical context. There's a lot of elements, data quality and things like that, really have to be considered in this activity. This is an activity that's been uh, led by, by Teek and engaging many other people, an application that can be used in the clinical setting, but also more importantly, a data model that's been built out that can be applied across the organization so that an oncology patient's observations fit into a common data model that can be then shared and explored. And this is a remarkable feat. Not many organizations. Uh, have, have achieved this, and we've not achieved it yet. We're still in the deployment phase, and there's much more work to be done. But a key element, for example, is working on methods that allow us to collect information on performance and recurrence in a tool that's efficient. But if you go through all these structures, you go down to very deep levels to try to choose some of these toxicities, and tuning that interface uh, to allow it to be collected efficiently in the clinic, tumor response assessment, collection of adverse events, uh, and, and, and different contexts, and specific to the different type of, of, of patient that, that we're, we're working with. That's one piece of, of the outcomes measure. I think it's a very powerful component. What about tissue and dry biomarkers? Are we doing anything there? In fact, we are. This is well aligned with our strategic plan. This is an activity that Terry Michelson, maybe many of you don't know this, has been leading on the sort of the side of his desk, which to actually to implement the biobanking platform across UHN to allow the tissue to flow into a single context and uh, in a consistent fashion. So over the past several years, we've been building this infrastructure and it's now running. It uses an open source platform called CA Tissue Speed and CASES to collect at clinical annotations. What Terry's been doing is the data's been collecting in there. Now he's got a plumbing tool, I like to call it, which is this SAP platform that allows you to connect different databases together and federate data and draw them uh, within to each other. And so this is just a few slides from Michael Rohr showing data uh, collecting within uh, within uh, uh, tissue suite. Michael Rohr heads up the biobank. The, you know, hierarchical patient events being collected, actually live pathology for a surgical context, but also the personalized deep molecular profile data is now starting to flow into the system from impact and compound. That activity is now starting to go into a single place across the organization. So these are parts of the big machine. Not really connected yet, but we're getting very close. And here's an example where we're actually pulling the data from the tumor registry, copath pathology via cases, and then we know where the specimens are. We've never had this capability before. And we're structuring a consistent process to allow us to link these cases together. This is a more interesting, and the next level there, you sent me this last night, showing that we're now getting the variants parsed out of the uh, pathology report now into the platform. So we're building this across the board. Greg's here. Thanks, Terry, for your help on this. So Mary said, if it's a bank, I need bank statements. We need <laughs> bank statements. And so we built bank statements. We need to understand what the machines are accruing. We need to have an understanding. This is a very powerful feedback. I mean, the biobank is important. Show me what's going on in the biobank. What's being collected? 
Who's contributing? What's the activity? You have an account. You want to know what's going on in the account. You want to know whether you're working, you're working that money. Is that money being well worked for you? Is there value increasing? Because it costs to run a bank. It costs to have it. And so now the team is working on extracting these pieces of information, showing data now flowing into these platforms. And Terry and his team have been working, and Heather's here, and others are actually, uh, working to, to um, bring the rest of the disparate biobank together onto a common platform. This is a really huge, important part of that machine, because we know the tissue characterization is key. What about imaging? Well, we concluded, after some dialogue about it, if we're going to measure one 10 cancer signal for imaging, we should look at hypoxia. So we pursued this, and we're now building a thousand base hypoxia signal. It's coming online. A signal is great. We need to produce the agents. We need to be able to apply it consistently in, in the clinic. You know, really good uh, pet technicians like Doug Vines and others. And then we need to go from that signal to a feature. So that signal is then collected in the form of imaging, and we need to convert it to a feature that can be exposed to that whole pipeline. We maybe only need 20 signals for personalizing cancer. We don't know what they are, but we think hypoxia is a pretty good hand cancer bet in terms of characterization of the phenotype. So we want to bring that signal up within the system as part of the same machine. You know, it's not running perfectly yet. We still, you know, we're still have robust FASA supply, so we got our own cyclotron. It's not running, it's across the street, it produces uh, agent, it produces FASA, but not yet for human consumption. And uh, we're targeting uh, basically 30 days post-August, depending on how fast how Canada comes back to it. So that we'll now have a signal that characterizes a key microenvironmental phenotype that we think is critical to all the plots from Mike and others. And that signal will come online and we can consistently apply it in the We can consistently convert it to a feature. And then that can feed in the big machine learning architecture. What else? Um, we need to really think about not just the, uh, the signal generation, but the feature extraction. So we've got a great group that we've built over the several years in terms of quantitative imaging for personalized cancer medicine that really thinks about the commissioning, the technique maintenance, and then this pipeline. And this is going to be key. We published this in seminars of radiation oncology is coming out of it. Every radiation oncology program should think about having such an architecture. You've had CT. CT image is very robust. MR, more complicated. FASA, complicated. FDG, other molecular imaging coming forward need to be well characterized. We need to have an investment of pipeline that feeds imaging data into a process because we may decide our prescription based on that signal. We're fiddling with it to two or three percent and we got a PET scanner that's, you know, who knows what it's producing. So that kind of dependency becomes really key. I won't talk about this in, in detail, but we're leveraging funding from a variety of sources to build this platform. And I'm going to skip along. We recently uh, negotiated with Hugo Erics to bring his radiomics platform here to run on that architecture so that we can start to pull those features out and start to feed those forward in an analysis. So we're slowly bringing the big machine to life. There he is, is Terry Michelson. You can see him uh, in the biobank plumbing the, the, the like serum of blood. Uh, this, 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 uh, this is David Green over there at the cyclotron, the old VC there that day. Let's check uh, Terry for calluses over there. Yeah, so it's so the question is, are we learning yet? Uh, no, not really. Not really. I think we're still building. This is the problem. We have to, start, we have to really start about to think about this. We have some good people. We have some good stuff. But I mean, the machine needs that learning piece. Still. So we really have to think about what that looks like. Data visualization and machine learning platform. This is a huge problem. And machine learning, I don't think, should be something that's only done by a few people. In the future, you'll have the three R's plus ML. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and machine learning. Everybody has to know how to machine learn. It's like saying, no, I'm not going to use a calculator, I'm going to call someone to use a calculator. No, no. Machine learning is the way humans will learn in the future. It's going to be a basic skill. So it can be an outsourced activity. There will be experts. There's always experts. But machine learning is something that we all need to understand. Because it's the way we learn. It's crazy. Oh, that's a computer. Someone will use a computer for me. No. Machine learning is the way you learn. Why would you outsource how you learn to somebody else? So we have to start thinking about that, our own skills, and bringing extras to help us. We have an issue of data and material access governance. This is a greater good versus return on investment. This is a general problem in the organization. Every organization has this issue, and I think it's, I'm not going to solve it here. We also have a question around the base funding for the big machines. What is the cost of learning? Learning is Are we willing to pay for it? So I would say we're kind of at this level. We got our seed drill out, and we're going to start, uh, you know, Planting, and this is actually corn, this is uh, 
because it still looks like it's clean. No, I think it's oh, it's sweet. Uh, anyway, you can see the, uh, we're not here yet, but we're working with different groups. IBM Watson was here just uh, last year, and we're talking to them about could we work with a few of these kind of tools. There's also other things that are happening. It's a really interesting thing that Terry brought to us called the Hanna Box. These are guys who are thinking totally different around federation. This is a really cool concept. The computational memory advances over the past five years are totally changing the game. These guys put a ton of memory and a ton of processes in a box. And then you say, okay, this, then you say, oh, can you pull this table out of this database for me? It does that. And it does that regularly for you. And then in that same box, it keeps that table. And in that same box, it's got an integrated machine learning architecture. So it's always turning on those tables that are constantly being updated. And it holds the whole thing in memory all the time. So the federation thinking, where you start to bring data together from SAP to stuff, you stop and get bank reports, that's not enough. All right, we could have the same data flowing in and the machine learning running continuously. This is the kind of technology that we should be looking at and bringing into the organization because we don't have the head on the machine yet. We just have these you know, kind of bambi like legs. So, in summary, there's a complex interplay between the testing of clinical hypothesis and the organic healthcare machinery. Organic healthcare machinery will not allow us to really push the limit as we get to these 20s and 30% factors. Personalized cancer medicine is an emerging medical, scientific, and technical challenge that pushes the field to address these issues. And we need to tackle the problem with the same enthusiasm that we engage other technological innovations. After all, it's just a bigger machine. Thank you.